Brown, a lot of times we see and we think when we're having this discussion, we see it as red states. You know, in Texas, in Alabama, in Mississippi, that's where they're doing it. But a lot of times, we see it right here where it's solidly blue, um, where it's people who we're told to vote for and get behind. They're the ones that have Monsanto sitting in the White House, as the last president did, you know. They're the ones that have these type of affiliations. How do we start to really push back, even when politically we're supposed to, in theory, be behind them? Yeah. And I'm asking you because, because your organization. Because, yeah, but y'all can get in on this. Y'all can get in on this. First of all, I want to say that when we vote, it is a tactical thing. You are not picking a life partner. You are not demonstrating every single value you have. You are saying which person will fuck things up the least. Okay? Now, if you have those right expectations. Right down. I mean, but let's be real. That's what it is. So, and, and when we vote for a president or anybody, that is one person. You know what determines how that person acts? Money and people. Money and movements. It is our job to make them act a certain way. So, so vote for who will fuck things up the least. Don't pin all your hopes on that, that no single person is going to be our savior. A movement is going to be our savior. Appreciate that. Hop Hopkins, how you doing, bud? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. So I have similar questions. You being with the uh, former president of the Sierra Club Board of Directors, and I, th I, th I think they said, that was the joke before, you know, like, oh, the Sierra Club, they say whales and all that, but, um, but it's a big organization, so I want to ask some of these same questions that I was posing. First of all, how do you see the political landscape, especially with what's going on in the White House today, and how does that trickle down with do you know these marginalized communities of color, which is what we're focusing on, and the Sierra Club is now, you know, uh, aligning itself with. Right. Well, I see uh, y'all hear me out, out there. Yeah. Cool. Right. I'm, well, big up for uh, Hip Hop Achieve for putting this panel together and having all y'all come out today. Let's give it up for them. Yeah. So uh, I see it as a long line of historical progression. It's just manifesting in a way that for some folks they're just waking up to it. But the day after the election, most folks like me. We weren't shocked and dazed and confused, right? We were still standing tall, not destabilized, because every other president before that had administered and promoted the same type of policies that were putting us in the graves and in jail. Whether it was a DRR that was in front of their name or behind their name. And so what, what she's saying right here is voting is chess, not checkers. It, you got to be looking down three, four steps down the road. And if you're putting all your... your, your eggs in the basket of king paying me, you're going to lose because you're not thinking right. And so what I'm hoping that in this atmosphere of resist, that that doesn't last for the next three years, that folks don't start to get this. What I'm concerned is there's going to be a backlash from progressives and liberal folks who want to get a Democrat back in the office, and anyone will do, and then they're going to forget about resist. And then they're going to turn on folks who are resistant and say, no, that's our time. we got to get back in the White House. So I just want to say that this is a long line of historical behavior on the on, on, on part of our governmental system. So we shouldn't be shocked and awed by what's happening now. It's just more open on the gloves are off. So I would just say that. And, and my hope is that with the awakening of a new, of some new folks coming to an old game, right, because it ain't just started with this last election, right, that folks will hold on to that. Whatever trauma or whatever's got you in the game right now, that you keep it going. Because if we elect a woman, we're gonna have to resist. If we put someone who's in the office who's LGBTQ, we're gonna have to resist. If we elect another brother or a Latina or Asian American, something, we're gonna have to resist. That's the bottom line. And I just want us to keep that in mind as we move forward. And I would say that for us, the Sierra Club, we, you know, we came out and supported uh, Black Lives Matter as well. And we had the same situation with some of our members who aren't necessarily there and other folks in the community saying, hey, what y'all doing? You need to stay in your lane. What, what, what's up? And so I think for a long time, you know, the Sierra Club is, our mission is to enlist, is to uh, um, enjoy, explore, and protect the planet, right? There's a, keep reading that sentence, there's a further part of it that says also to educate and enlist humanity to restore and protect the natural and the human environment. And I think our organization right now, over the last 30 years, has been doubling down on that part right there to try to 
understand that there's no separation between the natural and the human environment. And so that's why we can stand up and say we're going to support immigrants in this fight. That's why we can say we're going to stand up and, and support black folks from, and, and people of color writ large from getting killed and shot down by the, by the Pope. If you can put on the Sierra Club, uh, Sierra Club hat for a minute. I wasn't wearing it before? No. Because <laughs> I'm getting paid today, baby. <laughs> Well, then the good. All right, all right, all right. Let's go in then. Okay, okay. All right. Um, how does the Sierra Club identify and what specific or, or work with local movements that are coming out of the grassroots communities of colors? Uh, you know, uh, for example, the fights are many. So an environmental fight may be how do we start to decriminalize folks who've been criminalized out of the the weed thing, right? You know, that whole situation. How do we start to make sure that when they're putting grants out all throughout West Oakland, which is gentrified now, that is some of the black folks who have been doing farms and, you know, gardens, whether it's at McClyman's and other places, how do we make sure that your organization with its prestige and, 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 and muscle, so to speak, are able to make sure, like, hey, you know what? Let's make sure Miss Johnson down the street is recognized, et cetera, et cetera. How does the Sierra Club uh, center Native Americans looking at the fight at Standing Rock and making sure that whatever help they need is really held up and is, and is positioned as a primary source that we go to versus an afterthought, which is what, you know, like, let's put them on the stage and give them a cheer, but they weren't really looked to for guidance and leadership and their opinions weren't put in the forefront. So I'm asking that as an organization that is very large and is very well known, how does that, how do, how do you all move in those directions or are there other directions that you all are taking? Well, there are several directions, but I think that's a key direction and I think that's a key point for large environmental organizations like the Sierra Club, not to step in the room and suck all the oxygen out of it, you know what I'm saying, to take up all the space. And I was just talking to a sister right here about uh, local um, sustainable farming and agriculture. That's not a space that the Sierra Club needs to step into and say, we're going to go hire someone and then we're going to get involved in the fight. What it is for us is to understand the ecosystem and how those social movements and sectors in, within that movement are operating and how that overlays with us. And I didn't then to identify what organizations and sectors our values most overlap with and then try to be a partnership with them. And for the folks who've been doing it for years, who've been doing that thing, it's for us then to utilize our 125 years of prestige, clout, and resources to amplify and uh, uplift their work, not to get in there and try to do that work. So that's one thing. I think that's a that's something that we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years at the Sierra Club is definitely uh, doubling down on and recognizing what's our space and what's our value add to the movement. Uh, I think, you know, our organization, the HIMS principles, anybody know the HIMS principles? Y'all heard those? If I'm an organizer out there, 1996 to 1996, folks out in the Southwest, um, came together, a bunch of people of color, a few environmental groups came together and came up with these principles to talk about how we're gonna actually engage in economic and, just, and environmental justice struggles in a way that centered folks of color, marginalized communities. So that was given some guidelines and some guideposts for both the environmental justice community, environment, well-meaning environmental organizations that wanted to participate in that work and be in solidarity. But to do it in a way that the folks who were most at risk and most impacted were calling the shots and saying, hey, this is what we feel like we need in order for y'all to do right, because y'all been doing some wrong. And so let's let's help y'all out because you want to do well, but sometimes your well is well for you, but not so hot for us. And so they had to take charge, put out the principles, and we adopted those in 1996, and that's what we utilize in terms of how we're going to enter a community, how we're going to do our community mapping, and who we, how we're going to partner with folks. So I think those are some concrete things. I think my position, uh, the Director of Senior Partnerships is another example of that, of really looking at how do we, um, right, so when I came on board, I said, look, I'm not trying to come up here and be like, no, and bring two of this, two of that, two of this up in here, because that's not our role. Our role, for me, my job is to help the organization clarify its ideological position in order to participate in an intersectional way that helps support movements. You know, culturally, you can bring a person in, you can change a policy, but that's not what really gets it. We know culture is really that Trump strategy every night. And so if we can change our culture and the way we look at things and our analysis, we will change the culture of organization, and by doing that, we will then be able to be better partners within the movement uh, and help decenter ourselves and our issues and recenter in, in a larger ecosystem that's moving for social justice. You, you mentioned partnership. You can give it up for a whoa. Um, 